therefore time for a question period. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, good morning. My question this morning is for the Deputy Premier, and my question for the Deputy Premier is: Should the CEO of Hydro One have been paid four and a half million dollars last year? Good question. Thank you, Deputy Premier. Well, thank you, Speaker, and uh, good morning. I'm uh, happy to have the opportunity to talk about. Uh, about executive compensation, Speaker. This is something we take very seriously on, on this side of the House. As uh, the member well knows or should know, uh, compensation disclosure is, uh, is no longer required at Hydro One because they are now uh, a company that discloses information through the uh, 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 through uh, the, the stock exchange requirements, Speaker. So the reason you know is because it is disclosed not through the Sunshine List, but through, uh, uh, through other disclosures to shareholders. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, that's the whole point, Mr. Speaker, is that the Sunshine List doesn't include Hydro One employees anymore, and the only reason we know about the massive increase to the Hydro One CEO salary is because of the salary disclosures for uh, the Securities Commission that are required there. But the disrespect that's been shown when it comes to uh, huge raises for executive salaries is typical of what the Deputy Premier said last night on the radio, she said, so be it. There's no, there's no respect for taxpayers' dollars, according to the Deputy Premier. So be it. Whatever will be, will be. Live and let live was her approach last night on News Talk 1010. But that's the whole point. You can't live and let live in the Liberals' Ontario because it's too expensive to heat your home. So people are choosing between heating and eating now. So, Speaker, can the Deputy Premier justify the outrageous increased salary for the Thank CEO you. of Hydro One. Can she do that? Speaker, we acknowledge that uh, these salaries are, are far, far higher than, uh, than other Ontarians. We get that. We also get that uh, electricity prices have become too high for people to, uh, to afford. And that's exactly why we're bringing down the price of hydro by an average of 25 percent, Speaker, and more for people who uh, live in rural, remote areas, for people in low income. Order. My question, though, is, Speaker, we have a plan. We're implementing our plan. Where is your plan? No plan. Thank you. No plan. Final supplementary. Step one, uh, Mr. Speaker, and we've talked about it over and over again, stop the sale of Hydro One, but stop the exorbitant salary increases that we're seeing with the executive at Hydro One. Six times the salary of the previous CEO. I don't know how the Deputy Premier can justify that when we are seeing tens of thousands of Hydro One customers disconnected last year. Hundreds of thousands are behind on the electricity bills. They're in arrears because of the exorbitant cost of electricity created Shame. by the malfeasance and disrespect of this government. Yet, the Hydro One CEO made four and a half million dollars last year. That is an unbelievable amount. So, Speaker, my question to the Deputy Minister is, will she rein in executive compensation at Hydro One? Good question. Well, Speaker, um, it has been 29 days since the Leader of the Opposition told us that his plan to reduce hydro prices was only days away. 29 days, only days away. On March 2nd, uh, the Leader said his party would announce their plan in the coming weeks. The next day, he told the Barry Examiner his hydro announce would be coming very shortly. And then, on March 9th, Brown told reporters he'd outline his plan in the near future. And yesterday, Speaker, I thought yesterday would be the big reveal. I thought yesterday, at the speech at the Cambridge Club, Speaker, that the Leader of the Opposition would outline his plan to reduce hydro prices. Minister knows better. Wrap up sentence, please. 
Speaker, and the, the member from Prince Edward Hastings, I thought, would use his. As soon as uh, thank you, that that'll do. And as soon as I sat down, the member from Leeds Greenville decided to start. He is now uh, told to come to order. Without the editorial. New question. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker. And uh, back to the Deputy Premier. A couple of numbers for you. Uh, the CEO of BC Hydro has paid $490,000. The CEO of Sask Power made $454,000. Manitoba Hydro's top dog, just shy of $500,000. CEO of Hydro Quebec, $480,000. The CEO of Hydro One here in Ontario, $4.5 million, Mr. Speaker. Why? My question is why? Why is the salary so out of touch compared to the rest of the provinces in Canada? Cash for access. It sounds to me like uh, the opposition has a one-point plan to bring down hydro prices, and that is the focus on executive compensation. Focus on the real I think issue. the real issue is, Speaker, that hydro rates are too high that we are implementing a plan that responds to the issues that have been brought to this legislature. It has been 29 days. We're waiting for your plan to bring down hydro prices. We're moving forward on, or on ours. Sure would like to see yours. Thank you. Supplementary. The plan of the Liberals is nothing but a shell game and does not address the underlying problems that they've created in the electricity sector. They're the reason why people are falling behind on their electricity bills. They're the reason why businesses are leaving for other low-cost energy jurisdictions. But back to the issue of the day. This just exemplifies the disrespect for the taxpayers of Ontario. $4.5 million is out of control. Look at the people who run life-saving hospitals. The president at Sunnybrook, $700,000. CEO of St. Joe's Healthcare, about the same. And this government hands out $4.5 million to Hydro One. Speaker, it doesn't make any sense. Will the Liberals slash these out-of-control salary increases at Hydro One? Good question. Okay, the member opposite is making my point. They are really good at criticizing us. They are really, really good at criticizing us. But they have no plan. We're waiting for the plan. All they can do But, Speaker, I am, hopeful. Member from Bruce Gray on South. I am hopeful that today in Milton, the Leader of the Opposition will be unveiling the PC plan to bring down hydro rates. I'm looking forward. We're waiting, Speaker. Maybe this afternoon we'll get the answer. Member from Stormont. Premier, this just shows the flippant attitude, the disrespectful attitude of this government when it comes to executive compensation. They clearly don't get it. When we brought up Hydro One compensation back in 2015, the Minister of Energy at the time had this to say. When we look at comparable Toronto stock exchange companies, the pay will actually be set at the medium to low range with some incentives. Speaker. Is $4.5 million medium to low range to this Liberal government that have driven the cost of electricity out of control? Is $4.5 million for the CEO at Hydro One in the medium to low range? If it is, we've got a bigger problem than we thought. Thank you. So, Speaker, I think slowly but surely the opposition party is revealing their plan to bring down hydro prices. We have the first point. The first point is executive compensation. That's not going to get us to where we need to go. I hate to break it to you. So, again, Speaker, it's been 29 days. The member from Lanark. Lots and lots of criticism. We have had now one idea one idea to bring down comp of compensation, and that will, uh, as the opposition knows, have virtually no impact whatsoever on hydro rates for the people of this province. We are taking real action, Speaker. 
The member opposite is saying, so be it. He knows politics, Speaker. What they don't know is how to bring down hydro prices. We do, and we're doing it. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Speaker. Wow. Speaker, my question is for the acting premier. The current Hydro One CEO is being paid over 500 per cent more than his predecessor. His predecessor ran Hydro One when it was under public control, not now that it's in private hands. Rather, uh, the, the uh, salary is quite a bit steeper. Right. Can the acting premier tell us, Speaker, is it simply a coincidence that this ridiculous pay increase occurred at the same time as the Liberal government turned Hydro One over to the private sector? Well, Speaker, at least the NDP has uh, released a plan. It's not a very good plan, but at least they have released a plan. Speaker, we are implementing a significant reduction in hydro prices. We are making it more affordable for businesses, for individuals, for farms. We are making it significantly more affordable for people who live in rural and remote parts of the province. We're making it significantly more affordable for people who are in low-income, Speaker. We're, we have $200 million available for people who want to make investments that will reduce their electricity prices. We have a solid, well-thought-out plan that we are implementing, Speaker, and that's what the people of this province expect us to do. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the Liberal government has put its stamp of approval on a 500 per cent increase for the Hydro One CEO. Ontarians are understandably frustrated by the fact that the CEO is making almost $4.5 million, while entire communities are struggling to pay their hydro bills. Even worse, though, is the fact that the Premier has allowed a 500 per cent salary increase for the Hydro One CEO, at the same time as she and her party have allowed a 300 per cent increase in hydro rates for the people of this province since they formed government. When will the Acting Premier and the Liberal government take the hydro crisis that they have helped create seriously and stop their wrong-headed sell-off of Hydro One? Thank you. Well, Speaker, um, I know that these salaries are, um, are unimaginable for virtually everyone in this province. We get that, Speaker. Our focus is on bringing down hydro rates. The third party has offered a plan, as I have acknowledged, but part of their plan is to spend $4 billion to buy back uh, shares in Hydro One. That's $4 billion that has to come from somewhere, most likely from health and from education, because that's where the bulk of spending is. So we are moving forward, Speaker. We are reducing hydro rates because we heard loud and clear in this House and in our communities that electricity rates had risen too fast, too high, and that's why we're bringing those rates down. We have a credible plan. We're implementing yes, that sir. plan, Speaker, and that's what's expected of people in government. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, it is no coincidence that the executive compensation of Hydro One jumped by over 500 per cent while the Liberals started selling it off. This ludicrous pay increase, Speaker, is an insult to the many thousands of Ontario families and businesses who are struggling just to keep up with their hydro bills. When will the Acting Premier realize that the people of this province are fed up? They are frustrated and thirsty for some real action on the part of the Liberal government to reduce hydro weights and do what the people want. 80 per cent, over 80 per cent of the people of this province want you to stop selling off Hydro One. When are you going to do that? Seated, please. To the chair, please. Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker. We are taking action. We are reducing the price of hydro in this province. People have already seen an 8 per cent reduction in their bills, and come this summer, Speaker, they will see an additional 17 per cent on average. It will be more, Speaker, more for that, significantly more, for those who are having the hardest time paying their bills. That's, we have moved forward with a plan that actually is working. It, we've made fundamental changes to the hydro uh, pricing speaker so that we can bring down those prices because we know 
Hydro costs have been too expensive. They have been unaffordable, Speaker. We take that responsibility very seriously, and that's why we are acting. Thank you. A new question. The Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you is for the uh, Acting Premier as well. The University Health Network in Toronto has seen its hydro bills increase by $6 million in the past few years. $6 million could have gone to hiring 60 additional nurses instead, Speaker. Does the Acting Premier think that paying for soaring hydro bills is a better use of $6 million than hiring 60 more nurses to help people who need care at UHM? Thank you. Mr. Powell. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, lo I, I look forward to having this exchange with the leader of the, op of the third party uh, for perhaps the third time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with University Health Network, we provided them with an increase to their budget, their operating budget last year of just under $10 million, $10 million new dollars in addition to the existing wow. operating funding. But I have to say, and whether it was Sault Ste. Marie or comments about Hamilton Health Sciences or uh, other Windsor Hospital, uh, uh, the St. Joe's in Hamilton, uh, it has come to the point where one by one these hospital uh, administrators, CEOs, uh, feel compelled to come out publicly following her declarations uh, to refute them, Mr. Speaker, and to point not only to the fact that they are able to sustain the highest quality of care uh, despite uh, electricity costs being about Answer. 1 percent of that total budget, but they've made incredible innovations to help uh, sustain uh, the electricity Thank costs you. as well. Supplementary. Speaker, no matter what this health minister says, every single person in this province realizes that every extra dollar that's being spent on hydro bills that are soaring at hospitals is a dollar that's not being spent on health care for the people of Ontario. It is simple logic. The hydro bill at London Health Sciences has gone up nearly $2 million under the Liberal government. Will the acting premier agree that 20 more nurses would have been a better way for the hospital to use its already shrinking budget than paying skyrocketing hydro bills? The member from Beaches East York. Well, I'm, I'm happy to report that uh, London Health Sciences Centre, their budget is doing anything but what the minister, or, sorry, the uh, the member opposite uh, alleges. In fact, their operating budget increased by 2.4 percent last year, by almost 18 million dollars. But, Mr. Oh, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, you know, one by one, the member opposite continues to make these allegations, and one by one, and no doubt London Health Sciences will be next, but one by one, these hospital officials, administrators and CEOs come out, as they did in Peterborough, as they did in Sault Ste. Marie, to indicate that the member opposite, the leader of the third party, is incorrect, that, they're, that they are able to sustain the high quality of care, recognizing, and it is an important component, but it's approximately 1% of the overall operating budget of a hospital that goes towards electricity costs. And I spoke about Answer. hospitals like Markham Stouffville that have done incredible innovations or Health Sciences North and Sudbury saving half Thank a million you. dollars a year on electricity because of it. Thank you. Final supplementary. This Liberal government froze hospital budgets for four years and also provided less than inflationary increases after that. They have been starving the hospital system for years. The Liberal government is still planning to continue the sell-off of Hydro One, a disastrous idea, a disastrous plan. They're defending the ludicrously high salary of the new CEO at Hydro One, and they refuse to admit they refuse to admit what is plainly obvious, Speaker, that hospitals could be using money that they are forced to spend on rising hydro bills to improve patient care. When will this acting premier admit the obvious fact that her party has made a mistake with their hydro sell-off and put an end to it before it's too late? Thank you, I'll take it, yeah. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, so the uh, president of the Ontario Council of Hop Hospital Unions just yesterday, which is uh, OCHU, part of CUPE, Mr. Speaker, said uh, it's unfair of Ontario opposition MPPs to blame significant care and staffing cuts at our hospitals on high hydro oh, rates, according to the president. Cute. To wow. suggest that the root of our community hospital's yearly budget deficits in the staff bed and care cuts that follow is high, high, high hydro costs is 
to mislead the public. Mr. The minister will withdraw. I withdraw. May continue. So the president went on to say that communities know where the Liberals stand on hospital funding, but where do the PCs and the NDP stand? It would appear from their public comments that hospitals could expect relief in their relatively small hydro budgets and Answer. no relief on their larger underfunding problems, said wow. the president, Mr. Speaker. Wow. New question, the member from McKeon Carlton. Speaker, my question is to the President of the Treasury Board. Last night, in an interview on News Talk 1010's The Rush, I heard the hype. Last night, in an interview on News Talk 1010's The Rush, I heard the height of Liberal arrogance. When asked if the clearly partisan hydro ads made the Liberals look good, the Deputy Premier responded, so be it. So be it, Mr. Speaker. That's what the Deputy Premier of this province had to say about using taxpayer dollars to run Liberal vanity ads. Mr. Speaker, through you, how can the President of the Treasury Board allow these tax dollar funded ads to continue, or does she just think so be it. Thank you. President Treasury Board. Yes, thank you very much. And I'd like to remind everyone, Speaker, that Ontario is the only jurisdiction in Canada that actually has a government advertising ad. And the ads in question, just like any other ads we run, comply with that government advertising act. And you yourself have ruled that they're not, uh, not a, an offence to the legislature. So we're actually very proud that we're making able to tell the people of Ontario that we will have 25 per cent off. And we think that people need to know that, that that is useful information for the public of Ontario to understand, just like we think it's useful information for public to know about flu vaccines, useful information for the public to know about sex education and what's really in the curriculum, as opposed to a bunch of young rumours. Thank you. One moment. Supplementary. During a revolution, a queen once uttered, let them eat cake. And now our modern-day Marie Antoinette, the deputy premier of this province, tells the people of Ontario, so be it. Well, Mr. Speaker, you can't just say so be it to those people who are struggling to pay their bills. You can't just say so be it to people, particularly seniors, struggling between heating and eating. Order. Mr. Speaker, will the President of the Treasury Board stand in her place and apologize on behalf of the Deputy Premier, who's wasting this money? Order, please. <laughs> President, Treasurer Board. This afternoon. Do you want to respond? No, you can just say okay. Okay. Anyway, what I was going to say is what we wanted to say to the people of Ontario was, who will you help? When we ran. Stop clock. Member from the PN Carleton will come to order. Our message to the people of Ontario was, who will you help when we ran our advertising campaign about sexual violence and sexual assault and sexual harassment? And not only did people in Ontario see it, 85 million people all over the world looked at that advertising from and Renfrew. it changed public opinion in a way that we are very proud of. Within six months, 55 per cent strongly agreed that they had an obligation to have intervene when witnessing sexual harassment. 92 per cent agreed that they had an obligation Answer. to intervene when witnessing sexual violence. 83 per cent understood that if they went witnessed sexual Second. 
Your question, member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the acting premier. Children were removed from their families based on the results of faulty testing done by Mother Risk going back to 2005. It's not difficult to understand how deeply emotional it is to be taken from your family in the first place. Yet the ministry recently ordered insensitive posters to be distributed widely in schools, suggesting to children that the removal from their family may have been unjustified, leading to panic and embarrassment for families. The Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth has said, quote, on a hundred levels, these posters are potentially damaging to vulnerable children, end of quote. Can the Acting Premier tell us if she thinks that this is appropriate and explain how in the world this was allowed to happen? General. General. Um, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank the, the member opposite for asking a very important qu question. Speaker, our government is very much committed to protecting young people and doing what's best for them. We recently became aware of the Mother Risk Commission's posters. Speaker, we understand the concerns that have been raised by young people in schools and by the provincial advocate for children and youth. As a result, Speaker, my understanding is the Ministry of Education is advising school principals and staff to have the posters and materials removed from schools immediately. Speaker, we understand that some students may have been negatively affected by these posters and may require additional support. And it is also my understanding, Speaker, the Ministry of Education has asked school boards to alert their mental health leads uh, and guidance staff to be available to support students. If any students Answer. in our schools have concerns about the Mother Risk Commission's poster speaker, we encourage them to speak with their school staff or support. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Acting Premier Speaker. The flawed Mother Risk program has caused unbelievable damage to children and families across Ontario and beyond. These inappropriate posters placed in schools across the province have only served to incite Sight, fear and panic and make things worse for vulnerable kids. One mother described the impact on her adopted children as a punch in the stomach. She talked about children being scared that they would be asked questions by their peers and their teachers. The Adoption Council of Ontario is asking where the consultation was with adoptive families before these damaging posters were put up. Will the Acting Premier explain why the government di di distributed these damaging posters and requested them to be put into schools? Thank you. Attorney General. Minister of Education. Minister of Education. I'm committed to ensuring the safety and the well-being of all students in this province. And I understand the concerns that were raised by, by students, by parents, um, by the community, by the provincial advocate uh, for children. I've been in touch uh, with him, Mr. Speaker, and, uh, and we have uh, requested that schools uh, remove the materials uh, from schools, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we regret that the distribution of the mother, mother risk posters has uh, has caused concerns uh, for students, and uh, and we have provided um, uh, direction to the school boards to ensure that mental health leads are aware of this uh, situation, and uh, and that any student that needs additional supports uh, will receive that additional support, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's important that uh, that if people have concerns, I want uh, to ensure that they have the support in place uh, to to assist at this time. Thank you. My question is for the minister responsible for the poverty reduction strategy. Mr. Speaker, our youth is one of our main resources in Ontario. That they can become the persons that they want to be and that they should be. Our future depends on ensuring that the talents of all the young people of Ontario are allowed to flourish. However, there's often obstacles to this path of success. One of them is poverty. Monsieur le Président, I'm very proud that we have targets to reduce child poverty. This commitment is to reduce child poverty by 25 percent in five years. This would make a huge difference in the life of many children. Would the minister inform the House about Ontario's progress in meeting this target? Question. 
Thank you, Minister of Housing and Minister responsible for poverty reduction. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Ottawa Vanier for that question, which is so close to uh, my own heart. Mr. Speaker, last week the province released its annual poverty reduction strategy report, highlighting the progress made in 2016. Uh, here are a few highlights. We're increasing the monthly income of almost 19,000 families by fully exempting child support payments from social assistance benefit calculations. We're providing healthy meals and snacks every year to more than 896,000 children and youth during the course of the school year. We're delivering child-centered learning to 260,000 four- and five-year-olds through full-day kindergarten. We're helping over 115,000 households that are at risk of homelessness to remain housed. And Mr. Speaker, Ontario has now reduced child poverty by over 20 percent, lifting over 100,000 children out of poverty across the province. Thank you, Minister. It is very encouraging to see all the progress that has been made on this file. That concerns me. According to the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, 38. 1,500 Ottawa residents, including 15,000 children, visit food banks each month. For these individuals and families, the inability to access sufficient, affordable, nutritious food is a core symptom of poverty. In the early years of a children's life, insufficient nutrition can impact their ability to learn and to grow. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain how Ontario plans to tackle the growing problem of food insecurity? Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker, and thanks again to the member for Ottawa Vanier for her question. Speaker, when I was appointed uh, minister responsible for the poverty reduction strategy, a key item in my mandate was to develop a food security strategy. As a father of three, I certainly know the importance of nutritious food and the role it plays in, in helping to grow uh, strong and healthy children. And I can only imagine the worry that parents uh, who have a tight food budget to face in making sure their children grow up healthy and strong. Uh, it's for these Ontarians, Mr. Speaker, that we're working to create Ontario's very first food security strategy, building on our work to reduce poverty across the province. Our aim, Speaker, is to ensure every Ontarian has sufficient physical and economic access to affordable, nutritious food, including yes, in sir. remote First Nation communities. Speaker, this is important work, and I look forward to reporting back to the House on our progress. Thank you. Your question, the member from Nipissing. Thank you, and uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. The last year, Hydro One employees appeared on the Sunshine List. There were over 4,200 names. Their compensation had grown by over 14 percent from the previous year. This year, we only get to see five names, and the CEO's salary is up almost 600 percent from the last Sunshine List appearance. The government is still the majority shareholder. So my question is, why won't the government disclose all eligible Hydro One salaries on the Sunshine List? Well, Speaker, we're seeing some really interesting bobbing, weaving, deflecting over, over on the other side, Speaker. They have no plan when it comes to reducing the member from Niagara West Glenbrook will come to order. Carry on. They have no plan to bring down hydro prices, Speaker, and that's why they're talking about other elements, but we have no plan. 29 days and counting. Speaker, they're diverting using things like they're actually totally misquoted me. Uh, uh, I, I, I did not say what they said I said in the interview. I just had another review of it, Speaker. They're making it up. They're making it up because they have no plan to bring down hydro rates. 29 days. We're waiting, Speaker. The people yes, of Ontario sir. are waiting. If this party pretends to be a government in waiting, they need to step up. Thank you. Stop criticizing. Tell Thank you. Supplementary. 
Back to the Deputy Premier. You know, Speaker, people in Ontario don't appreciate this kind of dodging of the questions. Only in Liberal Ontario would cutting off 60,000 customers earn you a 600 per cent raise. The government is still the majority shareholders. The, Liberal, the Liberals get a say in compensation pay. Will the government put Hydro back or Hydro One back on the sunshine here, here. list, here, or do they think the Hydro One Millionaires Club should get a free pass in a year when they cut 60,000 people back who had to go home to a dark house? That we all share with the well-being of the ratepayers and the people of Ontario. It is one of the reasons why we took the step to make a more productive, more efficient organization to deliver those services, and they're outperforming, Mr. Speaker. And as a result, and, and it was very clearly stated out in the prospectus, what the executives would be paid, and it would be made public. That has been done. Of course, the executives are being paid based on their bonuses and the ability to deliver for the people of Ontario. And that is happening. It is why we are reducing rates by 25 per cent. It is why we've taken the extraordinary opportunity to further help those in rural communities. That is helping. It is why the company is being more responsive to consumers to ensure that they don't get cut off, especially when there's alternate means to support them. It is why they are communicating to the people of Ontario and to the ratepayers, which the opposition Thank hasn't you. been doing, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue. Thank you. Any question? A member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Acting Premier. During a town hall meeting that I held this week in my riding, I met a couple who told me they were living on a senior's pension of $1,400 a month. Their rent is $1,000 a month. They're terrified that their landlord will seek an above-guideline rent increase that will make it impossible for them to live in their unit or make it impossible for them to buy food. They were told they'd have to wait 10 to 15 years for an affordable housing unit. It's not clear they're going to live another 10 to 15 years. So after 14 years of Liberal government, why do seniors still live in fear that they may lose their homes because of an unfair, unreasonable, unaffordable rent increase? Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you for that important question. And it certainly is uh, top of mind for uh, for many of us uh, uh, living in uh, living in Ontario. And I can say, Speaker, that it's absolutely unacceptable that that so many Ontarians are faced with housing costs that are rising so dramatically, and there is real anxiety uh, within that market. Uh, you know, families on tight budgets, such as seniors, really are feeling the pinch of, of a rental market that is struggling to keep up with demand. So we're developing, as I've said before in this House, we are developing a number of plans to address both the anxiety uh, in the rental market and housing affordability uh, as well, Mr. Speaker. You know, we're working with our municipal partners to, to make secondary suites more, uh, uh, more readily available. We're, we've passed inclusionary zoning. Answer. We have frozen the municipal property tax. So in short, Mr. Speaker, we understand the anxiety. We understand the problem. Very good. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Acting Premier. The NDP brought in real rent control when it was in government. The PC government killed it, and it has stayed killed under the Liberal government. Before the 2003 election, Liberals described the loss of rent control as, quote, a betrayal of tenants, unquote. They promised real rent protection for tenants. But after winning the election, the Liberals decided to keep betraying tenants for another 14 years. Shame. Why should struggling tenants in Ontario believe that the Premier or this government will protect them from unfair, unreasonable, unaffordable rent increases? Well, thank you, Speaker, and, and again, thank you to uh, the member of the third party for the question. And uh, as I've said before, I, I appreciate the focus that uh, the NDP have uh, brought to this issue, Chief and uh, we Whip, certainly welcome uh, 
uh, them joining in the focus. Uh, what, uh, what we have said on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, is that we will be looking at expanding rent controls. Uh, we will be bringing in uh, a, a suite of uh, legislation that addresses more than rent controls. You know, we've been studying this issue, been, we've been working on this issue, we have been traveling across the province, talking, uh, talking about the uh, the uh, the uh, RTA to a wide uh, a wide variety of stakeholders, so that we can get it right, so that we can bring legislation forward that deals with rent control, that deals with expanding rent control, and a whole host of other issues around that fact. Mr. Speaker, yes, we sir. get it. We're working on it. Here, here. New question, the member from Northumberland, Quinty West. Well, thank you, thank you, Speaker. My question to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Speaker, there's no denying the positive impact the trees have on, have on our province. When more trees are planted, it helps promote clean air and, flight, and fight climate change, which explains why I've heard members from my riding of Northumberland Community West asking me what they can do to get more involved in the greening of our province. I understand that the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry has committed to planting 3 million trees across Ontario in 2017 as part of the 50 million trees program. However, my constituents said, my constituent and I believe there's always more work to be done. Speaker, could the minister please explain to me how, how my community can get more involved with the government's initiative to plant 50 million trees. Question. Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources, Forestry. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Northumberland, Quinty West, for his question. One of our government's priorities is combating climate change and promoting clean air, and the 50 million tree program is part of Ontario's efforts to improve air quality across the province by planting millions of trees each year. These trees will remove approximately 6.6 million tonnes of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere by 2050, the equivalent of taking 1.1 million cars off the road for an entire year. And as part of this initiative, I'm pleased to announce that earlier this week, our government launched the Green Leaf Challenge. Ontario's Green Leaf Challenge calls on the public to get involved in making the province a cleaner, greener place to live by planting a tree and recording it on our website. So each year, yes, Ontario plants approximately 3 million trees under its 50 million tree program, and my government is now Thank challenging you. the public to match. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I'm pleased to see that our government's priorities align with my constituents. Uh, Minister, in a similar partnership with Forest Ontario and the Highway of Heroes Tribute, one tree is being planted along Highway 401 between Trenton and Toronto for every soldier who has fallen, fallen serving Canada since Confederation, a total of 117,000 trees, and they had the opportunity to help plant some of those trees. I'm happy to hear that the Greenleaf Challenge will help people to connect with the resources they need to help our environment. Speaker, could the minister please go into more details about the Green Leaf Challenge work? Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member for his question. His community's leadership and enthusiasm is inspiring. Individuals, organizations, and businesses can participate in the Green Leaf Challenge by planting a tree, participating in a community tree planting event, or making a donation to have a tree planted on their behalf. Afterwards, people can track their progress at website greenleafchallenge.ca. This allows people to register their trees on an interactive map, accessing tree planting resources, and finding events in their communities. This initiative is supported by Forest Ontario in the province and honours Ontario's 150th anniversary. I'd like to thank Forest Ontario for being a champion of this cause and the member from Wellington Halton Hills for his continued efforts support his residents to get involved in local yes, tree planting efforts through the County of Wellington's Green Legacy Program. We're proud of our initiatives, our green initiatives Thank on you. this side of the House. Now, see, everything did come out without the heckling. It got done. Good Lord. I think you should stop. New question, the member from Dufferin Calvary. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. In 2015, the Liberal government decided to remove the powers of the Auditor General and instead turn her office into a rubber stamp for partisan government advertising. Since then, uh, this stamp. government has spent millions of dollars in partisan ads 
which the AG would never have approved. It's never too late to do the right thing. Will the Deputy Premier restore Auditor General oversight of government advertising by supporting Bill 112 this afternoon? Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Speaker. And, and I'm standing here very, uh, as a proud member of this government, uh, which introduced one of the most uh, strict and stringent uh, advertisement uh, on uh, uh, legislation on government advertisement. Speaker, under our le legislation, government ad can include the name, voice, or image of a member of the executive council or a member of the assembly. Include the name or logo of a party, or directly identify and criticize a recognized party or member of the assembly. Speaker, but when it came to uh, voting for that bill in 2004, you would think by listening to the opposition today that they must have wholeheartedly endorsed that bill. But, Speaker, they did not. In fact, in 2004, the official opposition voted against uh, that bill. And members like members from Simcoe Gray and Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, York Simple, Parisan Muskoka, Haldimand Norfolk, Oxford, Wellington Alton Hills, who are members today, voted against that bill in 2004. Thank you. Supplementary. The minister seems to enjoy history. So let's go back to history when you removed the oversight of the Auditor General and we dis did not support that change. We want to restore the Auditor General's oversight, and that's what Bill 112 would do. Ontarians expect their government to respect tax dollars, not spend millions on partisan ads. There was a time when the Deputy Premier believed this as well. Back in 2004, she said, it's just outrageous to me that governments spend money on what are, in essence, political pieces. What has changed? Why does this government think it's okay to spend tax dollars to prop up the Premier's failing polling numbers? Well, Speaker, the opposition loves the 2004 bill so much that they voted against it. They did not support it even then. In fact, they actually they pined for the whole old Mike Harris style ads where he used to stroll up on the screen and justify cutting, uh, closing hospitals, where he used to justify closing schools, where he actually stood there and flicked the life or uh, lights of uh, Ontario's public services and Ontario's electricity system, which we're still rebuilding in this province. And now they stand up and they say that was a that was a great piece of legislation. Speaker, this is nothing but distraction. It has been 29 days since we put forward our plan to cut hydro rates by 25 percent, and we still have not heard from the opposition as to what their plan is going to be, because they have no plan to help Ontario. Thank you. The minister will come to order. New question, the member from uh, London West. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, this is the third time I have risen in this House to urge this Liberal government to sign off on a project to address London's ongoing mental health crisis, which would allow ambulances to take non-acute mental health patients directly to the crisis centre rather than the hospital's constantly overcrowded ER. On Monday, the health minister said he is looking at the project. I'm sorry, Speaker, but that's not good enough. This Liberal government has been looking at the project for almost two years. What my community wants to know is not whether, but when will this project go ahead? Well, Mr. Speaker, I know that this, uh, this is the third time that I've had the opportunity to address this. So this is a request coming out of London from a great organization I think all of us know, the Canadian Mental Health Association, uh, that they have built and are operating a crisis centre that, that we are funding. We provided uh, $1.2 million of funding uh, for them to operate uh, um, a crisis centre. Uh, it's a great model, a new model, Mr. Speaker, a crisis centre for youth and adults uh, age 16 and up, uh, not just for London but for Middlesex County as well. 
They're doing great work. They're very busy because of the fantastic supports and resources that they provide. They have made a request, Mr. Speaker, for something which does not occur in this province, which is to enable ambulances to, instead of dropping off uh, patients Answer. at hospitals, to allow those patients to be taken directly to the crisis centre. The type of structure and governance that exists does not allow that in this province, but we're Thank looking you. at this proposal nonetheless. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, people in London cannot wait any longer. The mental health patients who are lined up in hallway stretchers need action from this Liberal government, not more excuses. This project will not alone solve the crisis, but it will help. It is desperately needed, and it needs to happen now. The Minister of Health is using the Ambulance Act as an excuse for inaction when it actually has nothing to do with the proposed project. I have another suggestion for the Minister. Will he use his ministerial authority to immediately recognize London's crisis centre as a designated health facility under Reg 552 of the Health Insurance Act so that the ambulance transfer of patients can be funded? Yes, well, um, Mr. Speaker, these are all interesting suggestions. Uh, I would suggest that, uh, that my ministry uh, as I've referenced, uh, I'm not prepared to uh, go against the law in Ontario, which is the Ambulance Act, that has the requirement that, that, that paramedics and EMS that they drop patients off at hospital environments. I'm not sure if she's suggesting that we redesignate the crisis centre as a hospital. Uh, she knows we've had discussions about this. Uh, we are looking at their proposal. Uh, their to my knowledge, Mr. Speaker, is no other situation in this province similar to that that she is requesting. Uh, we have suggested that should that crisis centre come under the auspices of the hospital, the London Health Sciences themselves, that that would enable that uh, dispatch and drop-off to take place. But it's a complicated issue, regrettably, Mr. Speaker. It's not something that I can sign off on, on a whim, not, notwithstanding how important this is. We have to do the work required. Your question, the member from Thank you. My question is for the Minister of Government Services. For many Ontarians, as you will know, buying a house is the largest single investment they will make in their entire lives. And a house, of course, is more than an investment. It's a home, sanctuary, home base for family, children, career, and community. Of course, your home should be the place where you feel the most secure. But, Speaker, for some, including those in my own riding of Etobicoke North, dreams unfortunately have turned into nightmares. And I'm concerned when I hear some of those constituents who've been left in distress with nowhere really to turn. Tarion provides warranty coverage and other protections to new homes in Ontario, but its all encompassing mandate, Speaker, and multiple roles create the potential for conflict of interest. Speaker, could the minister explain how our government is improving <coughs> excuse me, consumer protection for new home buyers and what our government is doing to change Question. current structural challenges created by the Conservative government of the time? Wow. Yeah. Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Etobicoke North and for uh, uh, responding to his constituents on this important issue. And I'm pleased to speak about the great work our government's doing for buyers of new homes in Ontario. As the Minister of Government and Consumer Services, I'm committed to improving the lives of Ontarians by strengthening consumer protection. I've heard from consumers and industry leaders about the warranty and dispute resolution process in the new home building sector. Well, I recognize that the building industry in Ontario produces high-quality housing, and most are pleased uh, to call their new place their home. I know there are ways that Tarion can be improved, and that's why we appointed the Honourable uh, John Douglas Cunningham to conduct a public and independent review of Tarion and our new home warranty legislation. This week, I publicly Answer. released that report and uh, uh, communicated an action plan, which I'm happy to expand on in the supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you uh, Minister. Of course, uh, my constituents and I of Etobicoke North appreciate movement on this file. Speaker, the benchmarks for modern governance, transparency, accountability and oversight have, of course, evolved over the past 40 years. And more specifically, the size and complexity of the building industry has changed dramatically since Tarion was conceived in 1976. Since its creation, Tarion's governing statute has remained virtually unchanged, and it's somewhat out of step with the times. 
but giving Terrian the responsibility to set the terms and administer the new home warranty plans, regulate builders and vendors, while also adjudicating disputes between homeowners and builders. Of course, it is impossible potentially to avoid the potential perception of or existence of conflicts of interest. My question, therefore, Speaker, is this, again to Minister McCharles. What is our government doing with the report's recommendations, and how are we changing Ontarian structure Question. to better protect Ontario consumers? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. So, following uh, the report's recommendation, I have asked Ontarian to bring in new deposit protection measures to better reflect today's home prices uh, and deposit requirements. Also, we're changing the structure of Ontarian by giving government responsibility to make rules and set standards to improve accountability and transparency. Further, we are giving the new home building sector the standalone regulator it deserves by separating the provider of the new home warranty program from the new home builder's regulator. And finally, we're making the dispute resolution process easier and fairer for homeowners to understand. I also want to stress, Speaker, the actions that we are taking will not increase the price uh, uh, that Ontarians pay for a new home. I would like to thank Answer. the Honourable. Uh, Justice Cunningham for his report, and I look forward to the changes we're making to increase Thank consumer you. protection in Question Ontario. The from Perth, Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Deputy Premier. Conray Shellhaus owns the Forest Motel and Woodlawn, uh, Woodland Retreat outside of Stratford. Conray has a problem. His hydro bills are out of control, and his costs keep going up and up. Last year, he paid over $21,000 for hydro. Oh. That's despite investing over $90,000 in energy-efficient upgrades, wow. including almost $12,000 on the LED light bulb retrofit program. My question to the Deputy Premier is, why is the government paying small business to conserve energy only to push their bills even higher? Well, Speaker, I'm, I'm sure this constituent will be very happy when he learns about oh, yeah. the steps we're taking to take down those electricity costs, yeah, yeah. Speaker, because we do know that people across this province are welcoming the changes that we are making, the 25 per cent reduction. So, Speaker, I, I think um, just to recap, we reduced bills by 8 per cent. We cut delivery charges to the most rural customers by 20 per cent starting in January 1st. Our new agreement with Quebec will reduce electricity system costs for consumers Amazing. by about $70 million from, from previous forecast speaker. We've introduced programs like the Ontario Electricity Support Pro Program, the Rural and Remote Hydro Rate Protection Program. We've suspended the second round of the large renewable procurement process. That saves us up to $3.8 billion. Yes, sir. Speaker. We've reduced feed-in tariff Amazing prices work. through annual price reviews, and that saving rate pairs a minimum of $1.9 billion. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Conroy isn't alone in paying more for using less hydro. In November, I asked the uh, Premier about Mike Carter, owner of Milward and Food Town. He's paying more than double for the hydro delivery charge because he isn't using enough hydro. Wow. Yeah. It's the same story with Conroy, whose hydro bill has seen a double-digit increase over the last four years, while his energy consumption has dropped 9 per cent. That's a 9 per cent energy savings and a double-digit increase in hydro costs. Speaker, while we're waiting for an answer to the question I asked in we're, speaker, we're still waiting for an answer uh, to the question I asked in November. How can this government justify something so stupid? No answers. No answers. Yeah. Well, speaker, if you think a 25 percent reduction uh, is stupid, I simply <laughs> beg to That's disagree, bad. Speaker. I think we are making uh, the importance, taking the important steps to reduce those hydro prices. People across this province are benefiting from that, Speaker, and will continue to benefit from that. Uh, speaker, I guess my question to the member opposite is, we are still waiting for your plan. We are still waiting to hear what you would do, what your best advice is 
We hear lots of criticism, but 29 days ago, your leader said that the plan was only days away. I don't know how Answer. many days he was talking about, but 29 days, we're no still plan. counting. New question, the member from Kitchener Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Skyrocketing high prices, hydro prices continue to negatively impact the lives of Ontarians and businesses. This is to the acting premier. Thank you. The Peterborough Examiner is reporting that a popular restaurant, Rollins, will close in April after a half century in business. Oh. Closing after 50 years, Peter Brueger, the owner, cited rising hydro costs as part of the reason behind the decision. And I quote: "The hydro bill has more than." doubled in the last two to three years, even with energy consumption going down. Monthly bills went from $2,500 a month to $7,000 a month. Uh, Speaker, members. my question is to the Acting Premier. Why did your government sit back for four years, according to your own polling, and watch high hydro costs negatively do impact not. businesses and jobs across this great province and do nothing? Do nothing. Thank you. Well, thank you, Speaker. And once we, again, we have an example of a business in this province who would benefit from reduced hydro prices. Businesses across this province, farms, residential owners, Speaker, people across this province are already benefiting and will benefit even more, Speaker, from our plan to reduce prices. Our plan provides for fast relief, substantial relief, wa relief widespread, long-lasting relief. Unfortunately, the NDP plan just doesn't pass the test. It is riddled with gaps. It is riddled with ambiguity, Speaker. The biggest ideas yes, don't do one thing to take one cent off one bill in this province, Speaker. They want to spend Thank $4 you. billion. Dollars Supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker. Now, we haven't seen this Premier's plan, a plan that they haven't had the decency to introduce in legislation and bring to the people of this province. This Premier's scheme won't save Rollins or any of the other businesses that we heard about when the Ontario Chamber of Commerce was here on Monday. It's too late. Your government did nothing for too long. The owner, Rollins, pointed out that he cooks with natural gas, so the high hydro costs were a turning point in his decision to close after 50 years. Speaker, what does this government say to the businesses who can't afford their hydro bills or to the employees who are going to be losing their jobs in this province? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Deputy Premier. Speaker, we're saying very, very clearly that hydro rates are coming down in Ontario. They've already come down by 8 percent. They're coming down uh, to bring the total to an average of 25 percent, Speaker, more for people in rural and remote areas, more for people with low income, Speaker. We are making substantial changes to the electricity pricing system to provide relief for exactly the kind of people we hear about in this legislature. But the NDP speaker, their biggest idea is to spend $4 billion. Uh, that's $4 billion taken away from schools and hospitals to buy Hydro One shares on the market. That would not take one cent off anyone's bill. Speaker, the Toronto Star has said uh, on March 1st, there's no evidence that keeping it public would make this particular problem any better. Answer. Under the NDP proposal, low-income Ontarians are being asked to wait and see. Thank you. We're providing real relief. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for the and Carleton has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the President of the Treasury Board concerning government advertising. This matter will be debated Tuesday uh, at 6 p.m. I'm, sta I'm standing. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.